Hey, you know what I just want to say to everybody like right out of the gate today? Thank you for being on time. You know, sometimes we do the first song and it's like crickets in here because everybody's kind of making their way. You know, it's okay. We're not mad at you, but I just want to say thanks today for being here on time because it sure did help, right? Good. Give yourselves a hand. Good job. So, hey, I want to tell you about one thing that's coming up really quick. Look on the screen there. It says Turning Point Worship. Last year we did a service called Revive around this time of year. Remember that? And it was a great day. It was all kind of music and testimony and, and uh, just some beautiful things happened on that day. Well, we're doing that again. And you see there it's August the 20th. That's not next Sunday, but the following Sunday. You'll see our student uh, worship team up here, our adults, band, choir, orchestra, the whole team. And uh, we are just looking forward to an incredible 
day that day. And we're looking for God to, to, to create some turning points in us and in you that day. Invite your friends, invite those people that you know who may not even be your friends. Just invite them too. And uh, let's all join together for, a, for an incredible day on that day. If you're visiting with us today, we're so glad you're here. We want to do a good job. We actually, we want to do an excellent job of making you feel welcome as you come our way. If you could help us with that, there's a, there's a tear off section on your worship guide there. If you'll just fill that out. And then after the service, there's a guest services kiosk right outside those doors. There's some really friendly people there. We've got a special gift. We'd love to say hello. Pastor uh, Lee and his wife, Gina, will be in the lobby as well. And we'd just love to shake your hand, learn your name, and thank you for coming our way. Right now, uh, let's be sure everyone feels welcome in the house. Turn around, say hello to those folks around you this morning, and let's continue to worship together.
me go ahead and have a seat uh, man what a what a great feel in the room today Amen. uh and uh I, i'm excited to be back i've uh i hope you brought your lunch today because <laughs> i've had a month to get ready and it may take me till three o'clock to finish today so um no i'm just kidding it's going to be good um just a word to our men now, guys, listen to me. So, this next Saturday, right here from 8.30 until 1, that's just a small piece of your day, okay? From 8.30 to 1, we're hosting the Righteous Men's Conference. It's a statewide deal. We are the host church. Um, if you procrastinated, it's going to cost you 25 bucks to come, Okay. But, uh, uh, you know, Major Phil Kramer, who spoke for us, didn't he do a great job? Yep. He's going to be here. And uh, uh, Chris McDaniel is going to do our music. He used to be with Confederate Railroad. He's going to be doing the music. And uh, uh, Kelvin Cochran, who was the fire chief in Atlanta, who is dismissed from his job because he wrote a book and took a biblical stance on some really major issues in our culture. He's going to be here. Here's the deal, guys. We're the host church. We're the host church. And so let me challenge you, if you haven't signed up, to go ahead and sign up today. Join us here next, next Saturday. We're going to have people from all over the state that are coming in. And we need to be well represented. We need at least minimum 100 men. Minimum. And we're not there yet. Okay? And so uh, you wives, put him in the headlock and just tell him, you need to go. Okay? And that's uh, this coming, this coming uh, weekend. And uh, school started Thursday, uh, uh, Friday. I was in Forsyth and... Uh, I went someplace and I came, tried to come back Thornton Road and it was gridlock. I mean, it was all the way down 41. I thought, oh my goodness, first day of school. So I went around Lee Street, tried to come in Montpelier from the other way, gridlock, backed all the way up down. And so I couldn't even get home until the carpools kind of subsided just a little bit. But let me, let me challenge you, uh, to, so we need to really pray for the folks that work with the children in our school system. Do you agree with that? In fact, uh, if you're an educator, if you're an educator, if you're an administrator, a teacher, maybe you teach at, uh, maybe you're a college professor, a college teacher, uh, would, you, would you just stand so we can see who you are? Would you just stand up? Let's give these folks a hand all over the room. Stay standing, stay standing, because I want to pray for you. Uh, I want to pray for you uh, today, and, and then we're going to receive our offering. And, man, thank you for uh, your giving and uh, your faithfulness to God. But let's pray for our educators. Father, we are grateful today for people that make investments in others, for those that are willing to pay it forward. And uh, we pray for our teachers, our administrators, our professors, uh, for everyone who's involved in the education process. And Father, we, we would ask that you would give them wisdom beyond their years. And Father, that the fruit of the Spirit would be evident in their lives as they go about their daily routine. We pray for protection over them, 
and around them during this time. And Lord, we pray more than anything that their actions and their attitude would point people to Jesus. And so as a church, we want to pray for them today. And we want to thank you for the way that you've used them and the way that you're going to use them this year in the lives of, of young people. And we thank you for the privilege of giving. Our educators are giving of themselves, and we've come today in worship, and we are blessed. Everything that we have is a result of your blessing and your hand in our life. And so we ask you today, Father, to, to just see our heart, our gratefulness as we give. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, let me just say it is really good to be back. Um, we, uh, we just kind of chilled out last month and uh, didn't do a whole lot of anything. And um, we did go and visit some other churches, and uh, that was pretty, it was pretty incredible, really. And um, just to go and see what God's doing in some other places and in some other ministries and to see that God is moving, that God is working, uh, that God is uh, changing lives and um, in just all different kinds of churches. I mean, some a little bit more traditional, some a little bit more uh, contemporary, some uh, a little bit more different than Baptist churches. But I'm telling you what, I mean... We, we, had a, we had a great month just going and, and getting filled up and getting recharged and ready to go for the fall. Um, if you have a Bible, open it to the book of Psalms for me. Uh, open to uh, Psalms 133. Psalms 133. Um, last month when I was off, uh, one morning uh, I woke up early, which I normally do, and uh, sitting in the sunroom, and I had my Bible, and I was having my quiet time, and, uh, and I was re I'd read a proverb for the day, and I'd flipped over through the Psalms, and I landed on Psalms 133, and uh, I have probably spoken on this uh, passage, uh, I don't know, uh, several times, and uh, I saw something that I didn't really think about before. And, and so that's what I want to talk to you about. Psalms 133, verse 1. If you have a Bible there, follow along with me. It says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for the brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, coming upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and coming down upon the edge of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, coming down upon the, the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessings, life evermore. You know, throughout our, our life and as our journey, um, you don't have to be a Christian very long before you come to a crisis of faith. Anybody here ever, ever had a crisis of faith? I mean, has there ever been a a time in your walk with God that, that you just came to a critical point uh, in that walk. And, and we really, when we have a crisis for faith, we're confronted with this question. Do I believe? Do I believe? And, and we wrestle with that question and we struggle with that question a lot of times. And and we, and we have to come to grips with that. I mean, do I believe? Do I believe that God really created the heavens and the earth and everything there? Do I really believe that? Do I believe that heaven and hell are literal places? Do I? Do I believe that Mary was really a virgin? I mean, really? 
Do I believe that? Uh, do I believe everything the Bible says? Do I believe? And so for the next several weeks, I, I, I want us to think along the, the, the terms of this subject, believe. Because really when you boil it down to it, I mean, that's where we are. I mean, we have to ask ourselves, do I really believe? And for the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at some scriptures. And, and as we look at these scriptures, they're going to challenge us uh, in some areas of our life and in our belief. And yet as we're challenged and we look at them, we're going to be receiving some wisdom that can help us as we discover the purpose that God has for our life. And so we ask ourselves, do I believe? And today I want us to talk about this. Do I, something happened. Do I believe, forget it. Do I believe in unity? Do I believe in unity. And, and that's what I want us to look at today. I told you I saw something in this passage that I never really realized before. I can, I can quote it almost from memory. And I've preached on it in churches. I've, I've challenged athletes with this, uh, this whole subject of unity. And I've challenged them with it. And, and we look at it. And, and so I saw something that struck me. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been like reading the Bible and you're reading a passage that you've read a hundred times over and all of a sudden, I mean, you're reading it and then all of a sudden, boom, there it is. And you're like, oh my goodness. And so I read it and I got all the way to the end and, and I read this phrase and it was almost like God just kind of, he hit me. It says, behold, how good and how present it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the oil that's poured over Aaron. It covers his beard. It covers his garment. It goes all the way down, and it covers the hem of it. And then it says this, for the Lord commanded the blessing. And I thought, wow, that's a huge statement. That God commands a blessing. I mean, do you believe that when God commands that something happens? I mean, do you really? I mean, think about it. You take your Bible, you open it up, and, and, and the very first words you read in the beginning, God did what? He created the what? The heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light, and let there be land, and there was land, and he separated the land from the atmosphere, and water covered the face of the earth, and he brought up land out of the waters, and he spoke every day, and something happened in the creation process. The interesting thing about commandments of God is this, God always commands in short sentences. He doesn't go into a lot of explanation with us. He doesn't try to convince us. He doesn't try to reason with us. He just commands. And so in creation, God said light, and there was light. And God said, land is coming up out of the waters, and all of a sudden, the mountains and the continents and everything just mysteriously began to almost supernaturally appear and were formed. And he said, let there be some foliage here, and plants began, and, and animals began to roam. And, and then he made man in his own image, in his own likeness, and he breathed the breath of life into him. And then he took a, a woman from the side of man as a helpmate for the man, a companion for the man. And all of this was done at the command of God. 
And so when you read your Bible, God commands and things happen. He commanded that. And you can read on and, and, and God commands in different places. But my, one of my favorite commands is when he stood outside of the tomb of Lazarus and Lazarus' body was decaying, it was rotting, it was stinking. And the, Jesus said, roll the stone back. And the disciples said, Lord, you don't understand. He's been in there for three days. He has baked in the heat. It's not going to be good. He said, go ahead and roll it away. And the command of God, Lazarus, come forth. And a body that was dead all of a sudden came back and lived again. I mean, do you really believe that when God commands, things happen? And so I would go on and on and on and talk about uh, the commands that God gave and things happened. But remember this, God's commands... The blessings of God swing on the hinges of our obedience. If I believe God and I walk in unity, the Bible says that God will command the blessing. All I've got to do is be obedient. If I just walk in unity, God commands the blessing life evermore. I mean, isn't that incredible? Isn't that awesome to think about that? I mean, when we look at that, we say, you know, if we get united, the blessings and the favor of God are going to be upon us. And I know this, I, I know every one of you want the favor and the blessing of God upon the ministry of this church. You want the favor and the blessing of God upon your family. You want the favor and the blessing of God upon your personal life. We all want that. I want it on my life. And if we want it, the Bible says that all we have to do is walk in unity. And if we walk in unity, the blessing of God comes because he commands it. So what does that mean? What does it mean to walk in unity? What it means is this, that as to walk in unity as a member of the body of Christ that worships at, at Mabel White Baptist Church, what it means is this, is that I cannot sow seeds of discord among the brethren or among the church. That I cannot sow dissension within the body then I cannot gossip, I cannot slander, I cannot tell untruths, I cannot cause confusion or division, I cannot be involved in that or do that and expect the blessing of God and the favor of God to be upon us. Because when that is a part of the atmosphere, God is nowhere to be found in that. Anytime you hear this, anytime you see this, anytime you're aware of this, I want you to understand God is not behind it and God is not in it. He's nowhere to be found. He has checked out because God wants everything decent and in order and the enemy wants everything chaotic and in upheaval. And so all we have to do is just get obedient. You see, unity, let me tell you what it is. It is the proof of brotherly love. Loving people are blessed people. They're blessed of God. And if you're blessed of God, there's no other way that you can be blessed. And so when, when we dwell together in unity, the Bible says God commands the blessing. But it's a complicated blessing. But this is the part that's really good. It's a complicated blessing, but it encompasses all blessing. In other words, it's the blessing of blessings. It covers every area. 
If we walk in unity and the favor of God settles and the blessings of God begin to flow, then God begins to bless in every area of our ministry. All of a sudden, the ministry begins to multiply. Why did the early church prosper? Why were people being added to the church every day? Why were 3,000 souls saved when Peter preached? Why was the church exploding in the world? I can tell you why. Because the favor and the blessing of God was upon that ministry, not so much because of the people but because of the obedience of the people who were just walking in unity. A couple weeks ago, Gene and I got up early on Sunday morning and we drove uh, to Gwinnett. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> but we went to a we went to a charismatic church. <laughs> we went to Jensen Franklin's church. And, you know, he's off during July. Andy Stanley's off during July. Everybody's off during July. But we got there, and we were at the satellite campus, not the main campuses up in Gainesville. We went there because Jason Crabb was singing at Gwinnett that day. But, but we went there, and they were doing a series called Let's Go to the Movies. And they were handing out candy and popcorn as you walked in the door. And the whole thing was on the video screen. It was incredible. But let me tell you what was even more incredible to me. There was not an empty chair in the room. They had overflow seating in the lobby. They have three or four campuses where that's happening. How does that happen? Tell you why. They're walking in unity. And the favor of God has settled upon them. A couple of weeks later, we went to North Point. A whole different ball game, a whole different uh thing and, and you walked in there and they have two big auditoriums on either side we got there early enough to get in the main auditorium and, and and still we watched it on video but you know what i looked around the room and there wasn't an empty room there wasn't an empty chair in the room a few weeks before that we went to first baptist church of woodstock and i mean there it is in the summer and johnny is in panama city uh, he was on sabbatical and i looked around and the room is filled and and people are being saved and the church is being added to it's just because they are united. You see, the enemy doesn't want unity within the body. And so it all boils down to obedience. Will I walk in unity or not? And so God blesses in every area. He, I mean, people are being saved. Wouldn't it be awesome if, if we had to have a Sunday morning service like we do, like we're going to have in two weeks, we got a turning point day, and I hope you'll be here, and I hope you'll bring your friends, but wouldn't it be awesome if we had a turning point day, and I didn't preach, and all we did was baptize people the whole hour? Wouldn't that be amazing? So say, well, he's not preaching today. We're baptizing the whole hour. We got about 60 people to baptize during that Sunday. I'm going to tell you what, some of you would turn bad to Costal by the time the service was over. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if you're, I mean, God blesses in every area. Wouldn't it be the blessing and the favor of God to settle and the financial challenges all of a sudden vanish? God blesses in every area. Wouldn't it be amazing if our young people were surrendering to missions and ministry? And I mean, and, and, they, and, and the ministry of our church was literally scattering around the world. Wouldn't it be amazing for us to be able to say with integrity and honesty, hey, the sun never sets on the ministry of our church. We have taken the gospel to the nations. Folks, I'm telling you, it's possible. When the favor and the blessing of God settle. But we've got to walk in unity. 
And so, notice it's an everlasting blessing. Uh, he commands on those that dwell in love his life forevermore. And here's the deal. I, I don't know your heart. Uh, you don't know my heart. But we can inspect one another's life. And this is what I know. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, and self-control, against which there is no law. And occasionally, we all step out of the kingdom. We'll lose our temper. We'll have a bad attitude. We'll say something we shouldn't have said. But it's not the pattern of our life. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But if you look and you find someone that is constantly stirring up strife, constantly stirring up discord, chaos, confusion, that is a good indication that that individual has not received the blessings of blessings, which is eternal life. In other words, they're lost. And so God starts with a promise on unity. He said, listen, just walk in unity. Just walk in unity. Just walk in obedience. Walk in unity. And I'm going to command a blessing. And listen, when God commands it, the devil can't stop it. The demons can't undermine it. The opposition can't stand against it. Because greater is he that is in me and you than he that is in the world. And so the blessings of God, the favor of God. But then it goes a little bit further. <laughs> it's like the oil upon the head coming down the beard. He said it's like the dew on the mountains. Now the oil, the anointing oil was perfumed. It diffused odors. I'm sure to the great delight of the bystanders, they said, thank you very much for using your deodorant today. But, but when it was poured upon the head of Aaron or his successor, the high priest, so plentifully it ran down his face, even the collar and the binding of the garment. In other words, the, the anointing affected the whole atmosphere in a positive way way. They said, oh, this smells good. Do you know that when there is unity within the body of Christ, that it is a good smell? People can walk in and say, ooh, this feels right. This smells good. But the absence of it, ooh, don't feel good. And something stinks at that place. I don't know what it is, but something does. You see, the oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Unity is impossible outside of the work of the Holy Spirit. And the reason for that is because we are so different. So different the diversity in this room this morning. I mean, think about it. Some of us are OCD. Some of us are ADD. Some of us are ADD on steroids. We are H-A-D-D. Some of us are high D personalities. Others of us are high S personalities. I mean, some of us are lions, beavers, otters, and golden retrievers. And so when you look at the diversity in the room, I mean, it's just a recipe for chaos. It's a recipe for confusion. It is the recipe for conflict. That's why we've got to have the Holy Spirit. He's the difference maker. Notice it covers our head. He, they pour it on the head. In other words, it affects the way that we think. That's why the Bible tells us, renew your mind every day. Because believe it or not, walking in unity is a daily battle. 
The devil never slumbers. He never sleeps. He never gets tired. Seven days a week, 24 day, hours a day, 365 days out of the year. His goal is to cause confusion and disunity. And if we don't renew our mind every day, we will slide off into the devil's trap. I challenge you, read your Bible. You'll never hear a witch in the Bible throwing a stone at another witch. You'll never hear an unclean spirit attacking another unclean spirit. The thing that is so amazing about this is that the enemies of darkness march in lockstep unity. They know the purpose. They know their mission. They know what they want. They know what they're up to. And every day in unison, they're out to cause confusion and chaos. It's only when you get inside the body of Christ with believers that the rock throwing starts and the gossip and the slander and the discord begins to happen because we fail to renew our mind every day. In other words, you've got to get out of the bed and when you, before your feet ever hit the floor, you've got to say, Lord, today, by the power of the blood of Jesus, I'm asking the Holy Spirit of God to so take control of my life that I don't cause disunity, that I don't cause dissension, that I don't say or do anything that would deflect from your glory and your honor. Help me to walk in unity today. It starts with the head, but then it's the heart. It covers his chest, the Bible says. In other words, they have a, we have a common passion we focus more on what unites us than what divides us. Do you hear that? We focus more on what unites us than divides us. So what unites us? Well, if you're a child of God, the cross unites us, right? Christ unites us. And so there is the unity of true love for one another. There's a unity of affection not necessarily of opinion. Somebody told me, well, you're telling me that we've got to agree with everything. No, I'm not, because that would be insanity to say that. My wife doesn't agree with me on everything. My kids don't agree with me on everything. You don't agree with me on everything. And vice versa. But what happens is we focus on the opinions rather than on the cross. Because when we look at the cross and we look at Christ and we look at the passion of the cross and the blood of Jesus and what has been done for us, then the opinion part becomes a minor detail in the background and the overwhelming passion of our life is Christ and his cross. And if we can't unite about around that, we got a lot of lost people that need Jesus. And so, we don't have to agree on everything. But that's okay. There's a deep, devoted love for one another. My wife doesn't agree with me, but I'm going to tell you what, I know she loves me. I don't agree with her on everything, but she knows I love her. Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples by your what? By your love one for another. But then it goes all the way down to the edge. It says the hymn. The hymn. In other words, the way we live. The dew. The dew settles on Herman. Syrian knights are noted for their heavy dues. It, it's not uncommon at all to wake up in the morning and to walk outside and it almost looked like there's been a downpour overnight while you slept, even when there wasn't a drop of rain that fell because the dew is so heavy and so intent, the whole area is soaked. That's what unity does. Syria, the heat, Baking the countryside, baking the vegetation. With no rain, 
the vegetation begins to wither. It begins to dry up. And without rain, it dies. God knew all that in creation. And he said, so, you know, Syria, because of its climate, is not going to have as much rain as South Georgia is going to have. And so I tell you what I'm going to do. They're not going to get much rain, but I'm going to send a dew during the night that is going to energize and revitalize the area, the environment, the plant life. And so when you wake up in the morning and you go outside, the plant that began to wither the day before all of a sudden looks alive, vibrant, and healthy. And that's what happens when a body walks in unity. But when unity is missing, what happens is the ministry begins to shrivel. It gets dry. And long enough, it will die. And so we need the dew to settle on our life. You see, the absence of unity causes everything dry. But the present is refreshing. This morning I had a spell back in my office. What time is it? Is my watch right? What time is it? It's 11.43. I got time. Okay. You with me? Well, four of you are. Okay. Here's the picture. Jesus is coming into Jericho. He's coming into Jericho, and, and as he makes his way into the city, uh, Mark records this, that there's a, there's a large crowd that's following Jesus as he comes into town. And sitting on the side of the road is a, a, a man by the name of Blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus is standing there, and, and, and he says, well, what's going on? What, what, what's happening? What's happening? What's going on? And somebody says, Jesus, Jesus, the teacher, he's here, he's here, he's coming down the street right now. There's this massive crowd, and, and Bartimaeus is sitting there, and he hears all the commotion, and he hears all the confusion. And so he begins to cry out, Son of David, Son of David, have mercy on me. Somebody says, Shh, be quiet. That was a Baptist. Be quiet. <laughs> you need to hush. Be quiet. But he continues to cry. Jesus, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And I saw something again that I'd never seen before. Jesus is walking, all the noise going on around him, and he hears, Jesus, have mercy on me. And the Bible says, he stopped. Joshua chapter 10, you remember? Israel is fighting in the promised land. The sun is going down. The battle is not yet won. And so Joshua cries out in faith. He said, sun, stand still. And because of his faith, the sun stood still. The S-U-N stood still. And Israel went on and mopped up and cleaned up and finished the battle. You remember that story? We say, man, what faith. <laughs> Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Blind Bartimaeus called out in faith. And the S-O-N stood still. You know, when we come into the house of worship, we come in and, and we just hope and pray that Jesus will pass through. God, inhabit the praises of our saint. Just pass through, Lord, and do a work in our midst. Just pass through. And we'll want you to pass through again next week. Well, maybe it's time in, in our life, and it's time in our church, it's time in, in, in our ministry 
to do like blind Bartimaeus did and, and just call out in faith and say, Jesus, have mercy on us. Jesus, have pity on us. Jesus, we've got to have your help. Jesus, we can't do this on our own. Jesus, and to have the presence of God not pass through, but have the presence of God to stop and to hover and to stay. I just wonder, is there anybody, I mean, is there a Baptist in the room today that would be unashamed and just begin to cry out and say, God, have mercy on us. God, change us. God, change me. God, change our church. God, unite us. And when we cry out in faith, knowing that when we cry out in obedience and faith, that God hears our faith. You see, God did not hear the words of Bartimaeus. God heard the faith behind the statement that he made. He understood and he knew that Bartimaeus really needed a touch from God. I mean, are we at the point where we just say, God, we don't need you for an hour and 15 minutes on Sunday. We need you every day. God, we want you to stop. We want you to plant here. We want you to abide among us. We want you to live among us. We want you to fill us with your power and your presence and your spirit. We want you to do something that we can't do. We want you to unite us because we want the commanded blessing that comes, not for our glory, but for your glory, not for our name, but for your name, not for for our benefit, but for the benefit of those that don't know Jesus. God have mercy. God have mercy. Well, what does unity look like anyhow? How do we get started? How do we get started? We get started by understanding whether or not we're a child of God or not. Non-Christians will never walk in unity. They will always sow di dissension. Every church I've ever pastored for 33 years, you've got the gossip mill, you've got the telephone team, and that's what they do all day, every day. They're not involved in ministry. They're not involved in sharing their faith. They're not involved in missions. They're not involved in doing anything other than sowing dissension and discord and gossip within the body. I have a video I want you to watch, I think, that addresses it pretty straight up. I was asked um, to speak at the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission's um, national conference, and they wanted me to study and then present on what it's like in the Bible Belt. And here's where I'm really afraid for you, and, and I'm willing to say to you something you might not ever want to hear again and never come back because I'm about to say this. In the Bible Belt, churches are jam-filled with people who have no mark of being Christians on their lives other than the fact that they attend once a week. No obedience whatsoever, no desire for obedience, no relationship with Christ, no seriousness about God. Like, this is it. You come, you check it, and you'll call yourself a Christian. And I want to lovingly tell you that if there's no desire for obedience and no obedience, you should not count yourself a Christian. You should consider yourself lost and in danger of damnation. And I know you might be going, well, that seems a little strong. How cruel would it be for me to pamper your religiosity when damnation's at stake? So you can go somewhere else. They'll talk to you about how awesome you are. But I need, compelled by the scriptures, to tell you you're playing a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous game. When you come and you sit and you listen to the things we say and you take no active steps of obedience, you're hardening your heart against the king of glory. 
What pleases God is obedience rooted in faith. Not perfect obedience, because we can't do that. And that's the point of Christ and the cross. We're not going to be perfect, but we will stumble forward. And if you're not even trying to stumble forward, stop it. You're not a Christian. And I know you got baptized when you were seven and you were in RAs and your parents are Christian and you're from Texas. That does, none of that makes you a Christian. So I'm asking you because this question, heaven and hell is hinging on this question. Is your life marked by obedience rooted in faith? Now, I was asked um, to speak at the Ethics and Religious Liberty. That's where it has to start. You know, Billy Graham made a statement years and years ago that he felt like 75% of people that attended church on a regular basis were not Christians. My wife was not a Christian when I met her. She had been playing the piano in her church before she could even touch the sustain pedals. She went to church every week. And on our first date, she got saved. And she's always been sweet, except when you make her mad. <laughs> but there was a difference in her life. In my years of ministry, I've had staff member wives that got saved. I've had deacons that got saved. I've had Sunday school teachers that got saved. I've got, had deacons' wives that got saved. We've had senior adults, 90 years old, get saved. And Matt Chandler hit it on the head today. Our churches are jammed full of people that have no mark of obedience on their life, have no desire to be obedient and they would tell you that they are Christians but when you look at their life the only thing that says Christian is that they attend a service once a week and so if you're here this morning I don't care who you are don't allow pride to well up in your life to the point that you say no to the Holy Spirit this morning. Say, I've got to settle this issue today. And so step one is you've got to be a Christian. If you're not a Christian, you'll never walk in unity. You can't do it. Number two, Matt alluded to it, fall forward. It's not a question of whether or not you're going to fall. You're going to fall. We get a great picture of that with toddlers. My brother and sister-in-law spent the night with us last night, and I got to see Bennett, my new little nephew that was born in October. And he's to the point to where he's trying to learn how to walk. And he's all over the place. He's crawling all over the place. And he's grabbing up, and he's pulling up, and he's holding on. Isn't it amazing how we have to learn to walk? Gina, when she went through her stroke, had to learn to walk all over again. It is a process. You've got to come to the place where you can fall forward. When I was in high school, I played football with a young guy by the name of Neil Anderson. Neil Anderson started on the varsity as a, as a freshman. He started all four years while he was there. Um, he was one of the top recruited running backs in America. Bear Bryant came to our little town to recruit him. Bo Schimblecker from Michigan came to our town to recruit him. Vince Dooley came and recruited him. Everybody wanted Neil Anderson in their backfield. Hate to tell you, but he signed with Florida. He went to Florida and he broke every rushing record that was at the University of Florida in rushing until a guy by the name of Emmett Smith showed up. Neil finished his career at Florida. He was drafted in the first round by the Chicago Bears. He was in the backfield with Walter Payton. 
When Walter re retired, Neal became the premier back for the Chicago Bears. About a year ago, one of my coaches moved to McDonough from high school. He called me up and said, hey, I'm in, I'm in McDonough. He says, I'm coming to Macon to play golf. And he said, if you'll go to lunch, I'll buy you a hamburger. And so we went to five guys and we sat down and we told war stories. And he talked about Neil and he said, let me tell you something about that guy. Anytime we gave him the ball, he fell forward for three yards. He said, in high school, it was amazing. He would get met in the hole, square up. He said, but you watch him on film, three yards. We knew that if we handed him the ball, it was three yards, three yards, three yards, three yards. In your life as a Christian, when you walk, you're going to fall. But walking in obedience says, I'm falling, but I'm falling forward. My intent is not to fall. But if I fall, I'm going toward the goal. And then the last thing we do is this. We've got to be a Christian. We fall forward. And then we just learn to do it. So, so what do we unify around? Real quick. We don't unify around a person. You're not going to unify around a person. You're not going to. Jesus walked the earth. He was the Son of God. He was perfect. He never sinned. He never sinned against a human being. He never did anything wrong. And they couldn't unify around him. They killed him. And so we don't unify around a person. We unify around a mission. Building lives that glorify God. That's what we need to be about. That's where the focus needs to be. That's where the energy needs to go. That's where everything we have is behind that. God, unify us and allow us to build lives that glorify God. And when that becomes the focus, everything else is a peripheral issue. And then we reach them, and the Bible says we make disciples. You are going to be held accountable as a disciple minister if you are a child of God. It's not the pastors make disciples. We need to. It's not just the deacons or the life group leaders. Every one of us needs to be involved in discipleship making. And so what do we do? We want them to connect. We want them to grow. We want them to serve, and we want them to go so that others will connect, grow, serve, and go so that others will connect. And that's what we unify around. Father, today we thank you for um, the fact that you and you alone are the unifier. No committee can unify a body. No person can unify a body. No strategy. You are the unifier. And so, Father, I pray today that you will bless and move and have your way in our hearts today. Scott, we're going to change up just a minute. Can, 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 can we just play something this morning? I'm just going to ask you to stand up real quick. Is there anybody here today that would say, God, have mercy on us? We, we need your power. We need your touch. Because you are the God of power and you're the God of miracles. 
You're the God that unites and doesn't divide. You're the God that brings order in chaos. I just wonder if there's anybody that would be willing to come this morning and just say, you know what? God, don't just pass through this place. Stop. Stand still and dwell with us. I mean, is there anybody that would be willing to just cry out, say, God, have mercy. Have mercy. Lord, change. Lord, move. God, unite. God, cleanse. Forgive us. We need the blessing. We want the blessing. Because we know that when you command it, it comes. As these continue to pray what about you what about you trust Jesus today? Do you need to confess Jesus as Lord of your life? I can just tell you if the Holy Spirit's worked in your life right now, the unholy spirit is working against you. There's a hesitancy to move and a hesitancy to trust and a hesitancy to confess. those that like Gina was you were religious but there was no mark of obedience on your life anybody else need to come maybe you need to unite with this church be a part of our body of believers here Father, we come to you in Jesus' name today, and we thank you, God, that you are an omniscient God. Lord, you know it all. 
You, you know our life. You know our attitude. You know the things that are public. You know the things that are private. You know if we're yours or if we're not. And Father, I pray today for those that may be here that don't know Jesus. And God, I pray that they would be so under conviction that they would not be able to rest because the Spirit of God would have such a strong pull in their life. I pray for others, Lord, and I pray for our church this week. And Lord, I pray that we renew our mind every day, that we would make a conscious decision every day. We're going to walk in obedience. We're going to walk in unity this week within the ministry of our church. And Lord, you've seen and you've heard, and we entrust you with it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give God a hand today. <clears throat> now, real quick, Rob's going to come and has got an announcement. But before, before we do, while these folks are making their way back, let me, let me say something real quick before we go, okay? Here's our takeaways. This week, pray that God will align your heart with the mission of our church. Walking in unity means that we are on board, that we are all in, that we are engaged. And I'm telling you now, Guys, if we do this, God will command the blessing, and the blessing will come in every way. Okay? And so, pray for that. Secondly, speak positively about your church. Let me tell you. God's doing some good things here. You know, and it doesn't take a lot of intelligence to be negative because we can all be negative, okay? And uh, me included. But just know this. Because of what happened here this morning, he's coming this week. He's going to move everything this week to try to cause chaos and confusion. And so what do you do if somebody comes to you? Shut it down. I don't have time to listen to this. That's not where my focus needs to be. And if you'll do that two or three times, they'll quit coming to you. Trust me. So speak positively and then guard against disunity. Just have your guard up. Because the Bible says that the servant was more subtle than any creature the Lord God created. And so it's probably not going to be the front on attack. It may come from other ways, okay? Hey, guys, thank you for letting me share with you today. I love you. I miss you this month. And uh, it's going to be okay, all right? We're going to be okay. Robbie's got something he needs to talk to us about. It's been such an incredible day in the Next Generation Ministries. We have Promotion Sunday and then just uh, here in worship and the word from Pastor Lee. Uh, but for several months, God has been uh, stirring in my heart and preparing me uh, to enter into a different season of ministry. And so I've been knowing that a change has been coming for a while, uh, but I've been waiting on God's timing and his direction. Uh, Lee and the rest of the church leadership has been incredibly gracious and supportive uh, during this time. And my time of waiting uh, has come to an end. I have accepted a position as the adult ministries director at Lake Oconee Church, which is a North Point partner uh, in Greensboro, Georgia. And it is a very bittersweet time uh, for my family because while we're very excited about the journey uh, that God is taking us to, we are very sad um, to leave the friends that we have made uh, here at the church. And for the last five and a half years, uh, the people of Mabel White have loved on and supported my family 
and me. And we will always be grateful for the experience uh, and the relationships that we've had here at Mabel White. And so August 13th, next Sunday, uh, will be my last Sunday serving on staff at the church. Um, but as we've reached this turning point uh, in our lives with our family, uh, we wanted to say thank you so much to the people and to the staff at Mabel White for allowing us uh, to have served here. And I know that there's always going to be questions about what the future holds, and I'm sure Lee will be able to answer those in the coming days. But I do want to say this. There is a fantastic team of volunteers who are committed to investing in the lives of our students and of the next generations. And this is an opportunity for unity for this church, for other people to step up and to surround that. And so we love you guys and we expect to hear some great things out of Mabel White in the years to come. But thank you so much and God bless you guys. Rob's last Sunday will be next Sunday. Uh, I, oddly enough, I was with him Monday when he got the call. And, uh, and so um, Rob's, a, Rob's a good guy. He's a good guy. He's a class act. And um, I have, uh, you know, a lot of times when God changes your heart to go in another direction, there's this switch that flips, and you kind of just are there, you know. And uh, he and I have been talking for months about this. And, uh, you know, one of the things I told the, the pastor where he's going, and so let me tell you, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the integrity and the character by which he's handled himself since he's come to this decision in his life. Uh, it is refreshing to see somebody realize it ain't all about them but it's about the kingdom and so we're going to pray for them and we love them and they'll always be kind of a part of us and and here's the deal we're we're not losing them we are sending them connect grow serve what go and so we are sending them and uh it's a great opportunity for him to be able to work under the umbrella of North Point. So, uh, anyhow, we'll communicate more this week about some of the things that, we, that are coming up. And uh, if you're a guest, thanks for coming. Tell you what, if you'll fill out a, on your card, if you'll say, you know, I'd like to go to lunch with the pastor, if you'll put that on the card and drop it by guest relations, I'll buy your lunch next week. How about that? Now watch 50 people say, I mean, come in here. I won't sign that. No, you ain't signing it. Okay? But anyhow, hey, have a great week and walk in the favor and the blessing of God. God bless you.